Well, welcome to everybody uh, to this seminar that Charles Goodhart is going to give us about the future of central banking. It's uh, uh, given who of us is in this room, it's uh, a real pleasure to welcome yet another uh, graduate of the economic stripus. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the, uh, there are rather a large number of us. Um, and I uh, first encountered Charles Goodhart not in person, but in the wonderful book he wrote on, uh, I want to say just banking, but it's a theory of money. What was it called, Charles? Money, Information and Uncertainty. <laughs> Thank you. The Uncertainty about the title. Yes. Uh, a wonderful book. It was the, where so many of us of that generation un began to understand about monetary economics. And then, um, so about ten years, m bit more later, uh, when I was working with James Mead, James Mead thought that since we were doing macroeconomic policy, we ought to go and talk to people at the Bank of England. And there was a wonderful day in which we, uh, in the morning, met um, Eddie George at ten o'clock, and you at eleven o'clock, and got such completely different views about what the Bank of England was meant to be doing that we, on the all, train all the way home, spent our time wondering what to make of it. Uh, as you all know, Charles has had a very interesting uh, career at the Bank of England then, uh, and then at the LSE, and then back to the Bank of England, uh, and then back to the LSE. And uh, he's become, in the last 10 years since his time on the Monetary Policy Committee, the leader of a very active group working on the future of monetary policy and related matters at the Bank of England. And it's a great pleasure to have him to come and join us talk this evening. Charles. Since you mentioned my 1970s textbook, I'll just tell you a very short story about Please. it. Please. Uh, it was actually written in 1973, completed then, and sent to Macmillan's. And Macmillan sat in it. <laughs> and the reason they sat in it was, as you will all remember, 1973 was the date of a huge commodities price bubble. And that included wood pulp and paper. And prices <laughs> of wood pulp and paper were rocketing upwards. Macmillan thought that there was a unofficial barrier to the price at which you could put on a textbook. It shows how long ago it was, because that barrier was ten pounds for a new textbook. And so they didn't know what to do. And finally, the way that they resolved this particular difficulty was to make the print as small as they could. <laughs> Subject that it was still subject to just to legibility, <laughs> with the result that most of the poor undergraduates and graduates who had to read the text got absolute violent headaches reading it, and I, I'm, for which I really need to apologise. Um, and while on apologies, um, I, what I'm going to be talking about today is going to be really quite long term. Uh, and this is at a moment with the general election coming up on Thursday, and Brexit negotiations starting shortly thereafter, and Trump on the other side of the Atlantic. It's very difficult to get one's mind out of worrying about the immediate future. And my intention is to be slightly longer term. Um, and uh, also, um, this is a, a European Studies Centre, and there's nothing specifically European. Uh, though I hope what I will say has got a fairly general um, aspect to it. So, um, if we're going to worry about the future, I, as usual, we have to start particularly by thinking about the past. Um, and it's my contention, uh, though, as always, it's a debatable contention, uh, that central banking has swung between periods in which there was a degree of consensus about what a central bank should do or a good central bank should do, uh, followed by periods of uh, uncertainty, a uh, degree of disarray, and struggling to find 
a new consensus. Um, and I start in this with the sort of late Victorian consensus, uh, particularly the Bank of England, but I would claim that the Banque de France uh, followed in much the same kind of lines, and other European central banks, the ones who had been established. Uh, we were all moving towards a gold standard. The Bank of England was on one. Uh, the basic principle for which I've always had a soft spot was the real bills doctrine. Um, I've always had a soft spot for it because it unified in a single doctrine both the price stability uh, line uh, objective of a central bank and the financial stability objective of the central bank. And the real bills doctrine, in effect, as I'm sure you all know, said that the pro proper appropriate assets for a commercial bank to hold were essentially bills of exchange which were drawn upon um, some real activity, either trade or production and inventory. Now, the reason why uh, it coincided with price stability was the idea was that real bills would go up and down with trade, and trade would go up and down with output. And if you think of MV equals PY, the quantity theory, that meant that M would be varying in line with Y or T or whatever you like to name, so that P would remain constant. By exactly the same oh. token, the real bills doctrine I uh, indicated that as long as the banks were primarily holding real bills, these were quasi-automatically going to be paid off at their maturity by the proceeds from the production and the trade and what have you. So it satisfied simultaneously the desire for financial stability because a real uh, bank held primarily, commercial bank held primarily real bills, uh, it would always get paid back. And it satisfied the price stability because real bills would vary in line with output, holding price level stable. Um, and of course, there was after Badgett, 1873 is the date of Lombard Street, uh, the central banks became lenders of last resort. We then went uh, into the first of our horrible periods, 1943-33, uh, the gold standard broke down. The real bills doctrine also broke down. Um, incidentally, as I'm sure again you all know, the Federal Reserve System was built and based on, uh, quite clearly, quite overtly, on a real bills doctrine. Um, and it was that adherence to the real bills doctrine um, that led, in many ways, the Fed to be slower uh, in expanding the monetary base and trying to uh, expand the money supply than it otherwise would be, as set out very nicely in Friedman and Schwartz. And the reason for that was that the deflation that occurred and depression that occurred so severely in 29-33 meant that the volume of real bills that were issued simply collapsed. And therefore there weren't enough real bills to discount in order to increase the money stock. And they had to shift from a real bills doctrine to uh, lending on the basis or uh, buying uh, or repoing uh, government debt in order to be more expansionary. And they took time and they were slow to do that. Mm. And of course there was the unemployment and deflation. And all that led um, from about the mid-30s to uh, fiscal dominance. Uh, it was felt that the monetary expansion, such as it had been uh, in the 1930s, uh, had not been terribly successful, pushing on a string. Uh, Keynesian general theory was becoming uh, more important. Uh, the central bank became specifically subject to the finance ministry. Um, one of the interesting factors, which is now surprisingly widely forgotten, is that the blame uh, for the financial instability in sort of after 29 and in the 30s was very largely placed, both in America and in this country, on the argument that there had been excessive competition. And the argument had been that the competition had been so great that profit margins had been squeezed, 
and the financial institutions, particularly the banks, had had to reach for yield and had gone into much riskier than otherwise activities. So that one of the, the uh, uh, sort of conclusions uh, was that he actually specifically wanted to con con contain, constrict, and reduce the scale of competition. Um, and that led the monetary authorities in the US, and particularly in the UK, and elsewhere, to encourage cartels uh, and to encourage restriction on competition in setting interest rates, so that interest rates were effectively constrained. Um, um, and I, if necessary, uh, under this constraint, uh, the authorities dealt with any expansionary, monetary expansionary forces through direct repression um, on, on bank lending. Uh, interest rates uh, were used to protect the balance of payments, but otherwise generally kept low as possible um, and not used to try and steer the economy. They were kept low in the, in the, in, for provide general support uh, for investment, and to a much lesser extent for housing, um, whereas fiscal policy was used to try and steer the economy. And all that went on until the 1970s, um, when um, a number of factors happened. Uh, first of all, the growth of technology, uh, and the ability to do offshore banking, the growth of the euro dollar market and all that meant that it was increasingly difficult, though not impossible as long as you maintained exchange controls, uh, to maintain uh, a non-competitive cartelized uh, financial system. Uh, so we got the development of liberalization. Uh, we also got stagflation, won't go into the reasons for that. And of course we had the massive dispute between monetarism Keynesianism. Um, and between uh, the 1970s and 1990, uh, the question of what should be the anchor for monetary target, uh, some kind of monetarism, sterling M3 targets which didn't work very well, uh, then you got um, Nigel Lawson shadowing the Deutschmark, and that didn't work very well. Um, and there was a great deal of of uncertainty uh, about how monetary policy uh, should be run um, in the context where in this country there was the, again the continuing debate uh, between um, monetarism and Keynesianism. And then um, starting with New Zealand, in a sense uh, the central banks were able to break through this whole question uh, of what should be the intermediate objective or the anchor, by going straight to saying that what we're, the objective is, uh, is to maintain price stability and control inflation. So let's make inflation the target. Um, and that, starting with New Zealand, swept the central banking world uh, in really in the early 1990s, um, together with the desire for central banks uh, to be independent, uh, on the grounds of time inconsistency. And what I think is actually rather a, a slur on politicians. And the old argument that politicians would uh, drive up inflation in advance of elections, and then you'd have to cut back drastically after elections. At any rate, in this country, there's really very little evidence that this ever, ever happened. Uh, but I mean, it was a, it was it was a, a, a time inconsistency is an idea that even if the empirical basis for it is pretty weak, uh, nevertheless is such an intellectually attractive idea. We all we all um, love hating our politicians, um, or at least hating those politicians for whom we are not going to vote. Um, and so, uh, and believing the worst of those politicians for whom we are not going to vote, um, and therefore, I, it was an idea which was uh, had great strength.
and the from 1990 to 2007, right, you know, give or take a year or two at the beginning, uh, was the just about 15, between 15 and 20 years, uh, with the greatest economic success that the world has ever seen uh, in terms of low inflation, um, steady growth, uh, more or less everything that you would want apart from uh, growing income inequality within countries. Though the rate of growth was sufficient that even the growing inequality within countries was not really noticed that much until after the great financial crisis. And anyhow, now we've had that, together with financial instability, uh, a persistent period of, I won't call it deflation, but very, very sub-target inflation, uh, which is actually quite remarkable. Uh, again, people simply don't sort of notice it. I mean, had you asked a room full of economists yeah. like yourselves in 2006, <laughs> would there be any feasible difficulty in the central bank bringing inflation higher? And I would have thought that probably 19 out of 20 of you, and it would certainly have included me, would have said that you know, for a central bank to raise inflation very easy peasy. I know for central banks create money. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Ergo, they must be able to create inflation if they want. I mean, deflation is difficult for a central bank because it raises interest rates. It means that people get hurt. It lowers the rate of growth of the economy. It's politically unpopular. Yes, there are problems in bringing inflation down. You've got to be courageous like Paul Volcker in order to do it. Inflation, creating inflation, should be easy peasy. Um, and people simply, I know, it astounds me that people don't realize that there's a great deal that needs to be explained. And how was it that eight or nine years of more stronger monetary accommodation than the world has ever seen, and we still have inflation in most countries other now than the UK, um, below targets? Anyhow. Uh, we did have very slow inflation and very slow growth. Though unlike the 20, late 20s, 29, 33, uh, the level of unemployment has been, again, in the UK and degree the US, with the exception of a very short burst in 2008, 2009, uh, really remarkably and splendidly low. Now, there were a number of generally accepted myths uh, before 2007, all of which turned out to be wrong. And I think, again, which a room full of economists, even monetary economists, would generally have signed up for. The first of these myths is that price stability would lead to a sort of generalized macroeconomic stability. And if you take a generalized macroeconomic stability, that plus the maintenance of the Basel II capital adequacy requirements would guarantee the solvency of all the banks. And I think we, we you know, this was generally thought that yeah. this was the case. And then, the myth number two was with solvency thus guaranteed by infl inflation target plus a Basel capital adequacy requirement, there could be no problem with liquidity. Because if you thought your bank was solvent, you could always borrow in the wholesale markets whenever it ever needed cash. So liquidity wouldn't be a problem. And if liquidity is never a problem, you don't need to worry about maturity mismatch. <laughs> so everything was sort of fine and dandy. Um, and of course, it all unraveled. Um, as Minsky, I Minsky, showed, uh, macroeconomic stability and price stability can generate so much overconfidence <coughs> that uh, financial institutions go off in a bender, leverage expands enormously, and then when leverage expands enormously, and particularly when banks can pull the wool over regulators' eyes uh, about uh, risk-weighted ratios and so on, 
um, that solvency is not guaranteed. And when solvency is not guaranteed, um, then liquidity can dry up very quickly, become be dysfunctional. And the one liquidity dries up very quickly, uh, maturity mismatch matters. Now, one of the, again, sort of historical things that I find interesting is that whenever there's a really uh, big crisis, there's always a radical proposal. And almost always the outcome is actually a compromise between mm. the radical proposal and where you started. Um, in the sort of early 1800s, mm. the Bank, of Bank, Bank Act of 1844, um, we had the suspension of the gold standard um, during the Napoleonic War. Um, and what uh, David Ricardo wanted uh, was not what actually happened. He wanted a full-scale currency board. Uh, and what the Prime Minister in the early 1840s offered it was a choice of three, which was leave things as they were, a Ricardo complete currency board, or divide the Bank of England in two, with the issue department effectively acting as a currency board, but the whole of the sort of unused notes and effectively the available reserve base uh, of the banking system, not spread out among commercial banks as a whole, but concentrated in the Bank of England. And that was the compromise between the currency board and doing nothing, and naturally, uh, politicians always like a compromise, so that's what we got. Can, and you, can, can you explain <coughs> what a currency board is? The only way I know to use that term is what Argentina did when pegging to the dollar. Uh, but your and Hong Kong did in 1983, which I was actually a party to. I was sent out. Uh, the, uh, the, the Hong Kong banking system was initially based on sterling. Uh, then they took it away from sterling, and there was no base at all. Um, and there was no, there was no, uh, you couldn't transfer the Hong Kong dollar into anything. And when Mrs. Thatcher had her row over the new territories with Chairman Dung, there was a financial crisis in Hong Kong in 1983. Uh, that upset Mrs. T. So someone called David Peretz, a very nice guy, Treasury, and I, was sent out, flown out to Hong Kong uh, to consider what to do. Um, and the sort of proposal, or one of the proposals there, which not ours, but we adopted, uh, was to link the Hong Kong dollar to the US dollar, known as the link, which was done. The Hong Kong Monetary Authority became effectively a, an exact currency board. And what a currency board involves is that when foreign exchange floods in, reserves, you issue more currency, one for one. And when it goes out, you reduce the amount of currency, one for one. And that, uh, but uh, Hong Kong and Argentina and whatever, a small place is tied to a big place. I, what I can't understand is where the big place is for Ricardo's currency board. There isn't a moon out there to latch yourself onto. What, what is it that you're boarding yourself onto? Well, remember that the issue department of the Bank of England would increase the volume of notes uh, as it's the volume of gold placed with it. And so it's the gold, uh, okay, it's, it's the gold standard Yeah, structure. it's a gold standard Thank currency you. board. Thank Hong you. Kong was a dollar standard I currency see. board. Argentina, I think, is also a dollar standard currency board. Um, and there are actually quite a number of currency mm. boards around the world. Thank you. Okay? Yeah. Um, then there's collapse of the U.S. banking system, <coughs> the Chicago plan, which effectively was uh, that um, uh, that the all transaction deposits, all site deposits, all demand deposits, uh, should be back one for one, um, either with uh, cash reserves, claims on the Fed, or with public sector <coughs> Um, um, uh, public sector debt. In other words, that the banks should not be allowed to undertake any lending to the private sector against uh, site deposits, demand deposits. Um, and that was again not accepted 
They were, it went to, it was put up to President Roosevelt and to Congress. And what they had instead was Glass-Steagall. And Glass-Steagall, uh, which divided commercial and investment banking, uh, again is now thought of uh, as a, primarily as a way of uh, making the commercial banking safer. Actually, when it was introduced, it was partly, partly largely introduced to make the banking sector less competitive. In other words, to divide the banking system into non-competitive separate bits. <coughs> and then we had stagnation in the 1970s. The radical proposal was monetarism <coughs> in one of its raw forms. And what we had was what was known as pragmatic monetarism. Uh, in that we uh, uh, tried to set monetary targets. Uh, <coughs> but when we found it difficult, uh, we didn't go to <laughs> extreme lengths to do anything about it. Um, and now we've got the problem with the great financial crisis. Again, the radical proposal is narrow banking, <coughs> and the compromise outcome in this country is being ring fencing uh, and various other bits. Now, um, inflation targetry uh, has run into difficulties um, because over the last eight or nine years since the great financial crisis, uh, the central bank has run into the zero lower bound. There have been limits on its abilities to undertake expansion, uh, and it has not been totally successful, either in bringing inflation back to target or, perhaps until very, very recently, restoring a reasonable rate of growth in the major Western countries. So what can we do about it? One of the suggestions is, well, why didn't you have a higher inflation target during normal times? Instead of having a 2% target, why not a 4% target? And people like Olivier Blanchard have been suggesting that. Um, I think that the central banking community uh, would certainly not accept that. It would, it would have, and if the politicians insisted, they would do it, obviously, but they would go kicking and screaming. I think there were two main reasons. Um, the first reason is that 2% inflation can be regarded with a slight stretch as being virtually mm. zero inflation if you take fully into account uh, quality adjustments and the development of um, non-payable services such as the internet. I mean, you and I don't pay anything uh, effectively for uh, our emails and all the rest of it, um, but it provides very considerable services. Uh, so if you think a little bit broader in terms of quality adjustment, you can describe 2% as being, in effect, virtually price stability. But 4% clearly wouldn't be, and <coughs> would lead people to incorporate inflation always, when it were, even when it was being hit, uh, into their plans and expectations for the future life. Alan Greenspan always argued that uh, what you needed is an inflation rate low enough that people don't put it, actually put it into their, their future expectations. Then there's the argument that uh, what we should have done is used interest rates to achieve financial stability by leaning against asset price bubbles. Uh, the BIS still tend to argue that. Uh, the weight of the general view uh, people like Lars Svensson and a large number of others, is that the, the increase in interest rates needed to deal with a housing price or an equity price bubble would be so high that it would actually destroy the real economy and for no really useful end. Uh, so that again, I think that the answer to that is no, and the central banks are now committed to try macro prove macroprudential measures uh, such as the Financial Policy Committee introduced, uh, loan-to-value ratios, loan-to-income ratios, 
uh, all that sort of thing first. Though nobody knows whether this might work, because nobody mm. yet has really tried it, or at least not in a major country. Um, one of the questions which I sort of raised earlier is why has the monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy, been so ineffective? To which my argument has been that the banking system, is, the commercial banking system, has been very fragile and under great strain. And the authorities were right to argue that if you compare two steady states, and in steady state two, the amount of equity capital required is much higher than in steady state one, that steady state two would actually be better and wouldn't lead to much higher interest rates. What they completely failed to mm. appreciate is that the issue is not comparison of levels, but the appropriate rates of change. And here the problem is that uh, bank executives are answerable to bank shareholders. Uh, and banking profitability, partly because of very low interest rates, has been extremely low. Um, and if you require banks uh, to issue new equity or even to distribute much more of their retained pro of their their profits uh, in retentions rather than dividends the equity prices go down because it's dilution of existing shareholders and it's the shareholders to whom bank management answer consequently when a banker is told to increase its equity ratio and the equity ratios have actually been increased quite a lot. The way that a bank manager will respond to that will be to lower uh, its assets, to delever. And what has happened has been that we've had a sort of a, a, a development whereby each country's politicians have said sotto voce to their bankers Please go on delivering, but do it abroad, not at home. <laughs> You've got to maintain lending to SMEs and mortgages at home, but do get rid of all your foreign lending and all your foreign subsidiaries. And that is actually what has been done, with the result that if, for example, you look at France or Italy or Spain or virtually any country in, within Europe, what you will see is that within that country, the banks headquartered in that country are lending more now to their private sector than they did in 2007. But if you look at overall lending to the private sector in each of these countries, it has been stagnant or even falling because French banks are no longer lending into Italy or Spain. Italian banks are no longer lending into France or Spain, and so on and so on. So that we, what we have done is we have actually broken the European single money market into bits. We no longer have a European single money market, despite the best efforts of the ECB, because the way that the regulators have gone about their business has meant that effectively uh, each bank has fallen back uh, into its own domestic area. Okay, um, how do central banks communicate? Uh, they started communicating about what they would do by saying we won't raise interest rates for another two years or whatever. That turned out not to be very successful. So they started communicating by saying, well, we won't raise interest rates, or we will raise interest rates once unemployment falls below X. And that didn't turn out to be very successful, because although unemployment fell rather <laughs> rapidly in this country below X, um, inflation did not, and wages did not grow really at all. And they still thought it wasn't worth raising interest rates. And one of the problems here is that even states of the economy are not entirely predictable. And trying to predict what you might want to do at some future date, conditioned on a particular state, 
you might find that that state is not as representative of the overall situation as you might want. Now, what do we do if we got another downturn? Helicopter money, which is really just a combination of uh, public sector, larger deficit, uh, together with continuing QE. More negative interest rates, where well, one of the problems is the weakness of commercial banking sector. Negative interest rates makes the banking banks even weaker than before. So that doesn't help. More QE, well, maybe. Um, let me go on about that. Now, contrast the role of central banks under the great moderation with where we are now. The great moderation, the focus was narrow, price stability only, a single instrument. Confidence by the end of that period was extraordinarily high. I mean, central bank governors like Alan Greenspan and Mervyn King and Trichet uh, were really the sort of flavor of the day. They were regarded as fantastic. Um, and the independence was undoubted. Now, after the great financial crisis, uh, the focus of central banking has broadened very sharply because we've got financial stability, which we can't define. Uh, Paul Tucker wants to define uh, financial stability in terms of what he calls, quote unquote, a standard of resilience. But when you ask, how do you measure the standard of resilience, you don't get much in the way of an answer. Instead of a single instrument, we now have many. Interest rates, as always, unconventional monetary policy, macro pro, stress tests, which are becoming undoubtedly an instrument of control, um, and new methods of resolution, bail-in rather than bail-out. Are central banks confident about where they are? The answer to that one is no, much less than they were after 2007. Um, and the independence is at some risk. <coughs> and the, despite the central bank having been the only sort of real positive actor, particularly the ECB in the Eurozone, uh, yes, there was a fiscal policy expansion in 2008 2009, uh, but for a variety of reasons, particularly concern with rising debt ratios and the fact that debt ratios are going to get worse and worse quite dramatically uh, from now on because of the aging of the population and the effect of that on medical ex and pension expenses. Uh, fiscal policy was, was cut back. So that the only persistent expansionary policy has been monetary. And you might say, well, surely, given how gloomy these last eight years or so have been, the central banks ought to be, have a lot of praise for being the only, only sort of um, game in town. Well, they've been criticized, I think, on four grounds, which I call the four Ds, which I haven't put up sort of theory. Um, and the four Ds are uh, debt, uh, distribution, direction, and duration. Uh, central banks have got themselves in practice into what I would describe as a very difficult debt trap. Uh, it, the expansionary process had as its center an attempt to provide massive liquidity and lower interest rates to the lowest possible level and beyond. The purpose of that, quite patently and understandably, uh, was to encourage borrowers to issue debt. So now what we have is a huge increase in debt ratios virtually everywhere, with two exceptions. First, the debt ratios of the banking system have been cut back, the leverage ratios of the banks have been cut back, and Germany has been reducing its debt. Virtually everywhere else and in all sectors, the debt ratios have been increasing. They've been increasing to such a level, um, and they are un the increase in debt of the public sector, of all public sectors, again, apart from Germany, um, 
is unprecedented in peacetime. And as I said, because of demography, it's going to get a lot worse. The increase in the debt ratios of the household sector in most countries, not the US and the UK, and of the non-financial corporate sector has been increasing dramatically. Central banks are now in a position where they hardly dare increase interest rates by very much because the debt ratios are so great that the impact of raising interest rates on the indebted sectors could bring forth another recession. So we're in a debt trap. Low interest rates have increased debt ratios by so much that the central banks cannot increase interest rates without risk and therefore will keep interest rates low which lead to yet higher debt. And one of the questions for the future, and some people might even think the question for the future, is how do we get out of this debt trap? Second thing for which they are criticized is distributional effects. Uh, this, the, the argument that is generally made somewhat unthinkingly is that the very expansionary central banking policies uh, have worsened inequality. Now, at one remove, the central bankers object to this criticism very, very strongly. Central banks argue that the people who really get hit in a depression are the poor and the workers, the low paid, because they, they become unemployed. So that if you look at income distribution and income inequality, Central banks, and I think rightly claim, that their policies have not induced inequality. But if you look at wealth inequality, it's very difficult, I think, to do other than accept that wealth inequality has almost certainly worsened, because effectively the effect of lower interest rates is to um, raise asset prices, and assets are held by the wealthy by definition, and not by the poor. Um, it's interesting that central banks have got sucked into the distributional argument because interest rates always have distributional effects. I think the difference is that in the last 30 years, the trend movement of interest rates has consist consistently been in one direction, downwards. Whereas previously, people thought that interest rates would move up or down and you would get back to some kind of norm. So that I'm whichever one temporarily would sort of lose again. But it's not been like that for the last 30 years. The directional effect uh, is obviously where um, uh, the central bank, through its quantitative easing, um, has uh, purchased different kinds of assets uh, and at different maturities and has therefore affected both the shape of the yield curve um, and also uh, particularly in the US and Japan, um, uh, has affected different segments of, uh, of financial assets. And of course in Europe there's the argument about whether QE uh, is benefiting Italy and Spain at the potential expense of, of Germany. The final one, duration, is in a sense criticism that will come. It hasn't arrived strongly yet. And that is what has happened is that QE has led uh, to the central bank buying up something of the order of, I'm taking the number off the wall, and so we don't take this seriously, but I'm something of the order of 25 to 33 percent of the total public sector debt. What it is doing is it is swapping site liabilities, which it now issues as liabilities, and holding much longer dated liabilities. So QE has the direct effect of dramatically shortening the overall duration of the public sector debt. Now, if you are at a point where interest rates are at an all-time low, what you want on many grounds is to lengthen the duration of the debt, to take advantage of extraordinarily low interest rates, so that you can borrow at these very advantageous terms forever and a day. What we've now got 
is that central banks' QE has actually made our debt very, very short term. And the way this will play out is that as interest rates start rising, even a fairly small degree of increases, this will lead the central banks paying out very large sums to commercial banks who are the counterparts because they hold all this in, in reserves at the, at the central bank. And so the seigniorage transfers to the Treasury will fall dramatically. And maybe the Treasury will have to pay the central bank to pay out money to commercial banks. Now, can you think what sort of Donald Trump's supporters will say about this? Uh, you know, as interest rates normalize, um, seigniorage disappears, and the central bank, bank pays out wads of money to large commercial banks. I mean, the likely political implications of this will be very considerable. Um, on what assets? Uh, because central banks hold now almost no reserves. Now, you did, what they hold is they hold public sector debt. And all that, what they you. had. So yeah. that they have to go on paying out. Uh, so they receive the interest on these. But their liabilities are site liabilities to the commercial banks. And the, the sort of figure that sticks in my mind is that the, the, the reserve base of commercial banks in the US with the Federal Reserve System have increased by a factor of 100 since 2007. I see. I see. OK. Now, some, a few key trends. Um, <coughs> the deflationary pressure, we've had massive deflationary pressures from a combination of demography and the arrival of China uh, and Eastern Europe into the worldwide trading system. Uh, that trend is reversing dramatically as we look at it. Uh, Chinese working population is about to go down as rapidly as the Japanese. Uh, the um, working population in Germany is going to collapse. Uh, we are entering a world in which the dependency ratios, instead of going down, are going to go up very sharply. Um, as I said, fiscal policy is limited in a bit by convention and then by rising debt ratios. Um, so the monetary policy has been generally expansionary. Uh, it did have success with price stability, <coughs> but less so with financial stability. Now, these are some numbers, uh, which I actually took in 2015 for another paper, but I thought I would simply show them here. This is the change in the debt ratio, percentage change in the debt ratio, since the end of 2007. Uh, and the brighter the red, the greater the, the change in the debt ratio. Um, as you will see, the public sector debt ratios <coughs> that's the government, um, have been re rising really pretty quickly, except in Sweden and Germany. HH stands for households, NFC stands for non-financial companies, and the PSC stands for private sector uh, corporations. Um, and interestingly, the countries <coughs> which survived um, the great financial crisis relatively easily, Australia, Canada, and Sweden, um, are now very much at the head <coughs> of, the, um, of the increase in, in debt, particularly in their private sector and the household sector. Uh, with the <coughs> increase in housing prices in the main urban centres of Sweden, uh, Canada and Australia, I'm less sure about Australia, I think I'm right, but I do know Australia and uh, Sweden and Canada. I, I've been and Sweden and Canada are very much the kind of situation uh, that the US and the UK were in 2007. Um, and uh, just are these percent of GDP? Uh, no, these are percentage increases. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Now, as a percent of GDP, I'm just going to show the... Um, <coughs> this is levels. And again, this is 2015. Now, this one is levels, not percentage change. Um, um, and look at some of what's the situation in, in Asia. <coughs> and in Asia, particularly China, uh, weathered the great financial crisis 
uh, by allowing their debt, encouraging their debt and investment to increase dramatically. Uh, the Chinese, and this was 2015, the Chinese debt, overall debt ratio is probably over 300. Uh, one of the great questions, which I leave for you, because I really don't know the answer to it, uh, it depends how I feel it when I wake up in the morning, uh, whether, uh, is the Chinese debt ratio, which is huge, is it a real problem, or it does the fact that China is a single party, state-controlled, quasi-socialist economy, does it mean that it's, it doesn't need to worry about debt? Because almost all this debt is in state-owned enterprises, which are owned by one, owed by one sector of the state system to another sector of the state system. So do you need to worry about the Chinese debt ratio? And the answer is, I don't know. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Um, but then there's South Korea, uh, Indonesia, uh, India, Malaysia, Thailand. You can see um, uh, <coughs> all of those, with the possible exception of Indonesia. Um, and again, some of the Eastern <coughs> European. And debt ratios, debt ratios really are extraordinarily high. And one of the great questions is essentially, what can we do about it? Before that? you go on, can I ask a, a, a simple arithmetic question, because I've never understood this. Uh, that there is no one else out there in the universe to which people can be indebted to. No, uh, uh, that debt is matched exactly one for one by claims. The problem is um, that when things go wrong, the people who owe debt will find it very hard to repay it without either cutting back very greatly or uh, going into default. While the creditors won't expand equivalent. Mm. So the problem is that debt has an asymmetry whereby if things go wrong, the, the debtors are forced to, into an immediate and sharp cutback, which is not offset at all um, by the fact that there are people out there who, who hold claims on them. And if you're going to deal with this in part by default, yeah. the creditors themselves are not so happy. That's the great advantage of um, equity, because equity, sort of, it, it, it's balanced, while debt is asymmetric. But those pictures there, you could have uh, every other sector except the private sector, zero, and the private sector could have a very big number because it would be indebted to itself. Yes, but the, it's indebted to itself. And so but this, this is a but gross concept rather than the net concept it, in some yeah, sense. Yes, indeed That's, it is. Thank but you. the point here is it has to be gross because the identity the of, the, of, the, of the debtors and the creditors are different. That, yeah. And the debtors will behave differently from the creditors. Thank you. Okay. Um, future trends, I've talked about demography. Uh, apart from Africa, uh, which is where uh, there are going to be a huge number of other workers. If you really, really want to feel depressed, uh, there's a book just out there by a man who is an HSBC economist called Stephen King which is called Grave New World. And one of the features of Stephen King's dejection about the future is that he sees millions of Africans trying to move from Central Africa, in particular Nigeria, to Europe. Um, and he thinks this is bound to happen. And he thinks that this will cause all kinds of political and social problems. I, basically, what he says is that there were sort of 15 million Syrians wanting to move. That caused a problem. There were probably 150 million Africans who will want to move. In other words, the problem will be 10 times worse uh, in future. Um, now, the next trend is that given the decline in the ratio of workers' 
their overall dependence, um, the workers will have to be taxed much more than they ever have been. And tax rates will have to go up enormously. I, you know, as I say whenever I lecture to a group of undergraduates or graduates, uh, you know, all of you will be jolly lucky if you're able to retire much before, much before you're in your 70s. Um, you know, unlike uh, my generation, which could retire at 65 or earlier. Because there are going to be fewer workers and more dependents, there are going to be rising inflationary pressures. I, I just don't think it's actually hardly understood uh, how much the sort of deflationary trends uh, have been uh, caused by sort of the underlying demography arrival of China into the world system and how much this is going to change over the next 30 years. The next, if you think that the future is going to be like the past, it just isn't. It's going to be totally different. Um, now, to keep price stability inflation target, I think that interest rates will have to rise back up, and we're actually going to need a lot of robotics and a lot of artificial intelligence, because there simply aren't going to be the workers. Um, and we're going to need much more productivity per worker. In this respect, um, Japan, which is frequently regarded as being pretty poor macroeconomically, uh, has been far better than the West. Productivity per worker hour in Japan is improving far higher than anywhere. In terms of productivity per worker hour, we in the UK are among the very worst, and the Japanese are among the very best. Central banks are going to be hobbled uh, by their balance sheet, for the political reasons I indicated, by the scale of the debt ratios, and by political pressure for growth, uh, particularly with populism. Um, and I think that it's going to be very much more difficult for central banks. Quite what the new consensus will be, I don't know. The likelihood of central banks maintaining the degree both of independence and of sort of reputation uh, over the next two decades, I think it's, it will be very, a very hard sell. So it will be much more difficult for them, probably more inflationary than in the past, despite the higher debt ratios and less independence. But I'm not nearly as as, to, as uh, pessimistic as Stephen King, <laughs> <laughs> which actually brings me pretty much to the end. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you for that.